Hi, this is Michael Altos. We are starting a section on blood, and this is recording part one. First, we'll start with red blood cells, RBCs or erythrocytes. These cells are responsible for transporting hemoglobin, which as we know carries oxygen. The cells also contain carbonic anhydrase and an acid buffering um, system that is done through hemoglobin. The cells, as you know, are shaped like a biconcave disc. They are basically a bag that can easily be deformed when they squeeze through these tiny little capillaries. The normal concentration of hemoglobin in the blood is about 14 to 15 grams of hemoglobin per 100 mils of whole blood. Red blood cells are produced in the bone marrow, so your vertebra, your sternum, and your ribs, also the long bones in children, so like the femur and the tibia. As we learned earlier, erythropoietin is secreted by the kidney in response to decreases in tissue oxygen, and EPO leads to increased formation of red blood cells. Other common cofactors that are needed to synthesize blood cells would be vitamin B12 and folic acid. So patients who lack these cofactors can become anemic. Red blood cells have a lifespan of 120 days. Many old red blood cells are removed from the circulation in the spleen. Now hemoglobin is a chain which consists of an iron-containing heme molecule and folded around it is a long polypeptide, or the globin. Usually a hemoglobin molecule consists of four different chains or subunits. Two are the alpha type and two are the beta type. Here you can see each protein chain folded around an iron molecule, and here's a schematic of the same uh, molecule. These four subunits come together, and they are able to bind oxygen in a reversible fashion, and that's how oxygen is transported. There are many different abnormalities of hemoglobin, including sickle cell disease and thalassemias. We will focus here on sickle cell disease, which is an inherited disorder of hemoglobin, it's transmitted in an autosomal recessive fashion. In these patients, they have an abnormality in one of their beta chains, and so it's called hemoglobin S. When this happens, the red blood cells, instead of having this nice biconcave round shape and easily deformed, they become sickle-shaped, as you can see on the left side of the picture. These cells aren't able to deform very well when they pass through capillaries, and as a result, the vessels can become occluded, and the tissues being supplied by them can become ischemic. The red blood cells also have a shortened lifespan as a result. Many patients that you'll meet actually have sickle cell trait, which means they're heterozygous. They have one um, hemoglobin S and one regular hemoglobin beta chain. Patients with sickle trait usually are asymptomatic and don't have very much risk. What we're mostly concerned about are patients who are homozygous for hemoglobin S. They have sickle cell anemia. Patients with sickle cell disease can have crises triggered by all sorts of things that are commonly encountered in the perioperative setting, including hypovolemia, hypoxia, infection, acidosis, and hypothermia. Some examples of sickle cell crises include the vasoocclusive crisis, which is an intensely painful sensation in a part of the body, and it's due to ischemia as these cells sickle. Many of these patients have had so many crises that they've become opioid dependent or tolerant. The acute chest crisis is a vaso-occlusive crisis of the pulmonary vasculature. A hemolytic crisis occurs when there's a sudden accelerated drop in the hemoglobin level, level due to rapid breakdown of red blood cells. These patients are at increased risks for stroke, infarction of the spleen, avascular necrosis of the hip, priapism, osteomyelitis, pulmonary hypertension, and renal disease. Just looking at this for one more second, when we manage these patients in the operating room, all of these triggers should be avoided. So these patients should be kept well resuscitated, warmed, not acidotic, not hypoxic, and so on. There are many different kinds of anemia. Anemia in general usually refers to a hemoglobin deficiency. Patients can have blood loss anemia which would occur after rapid hemorrhage or due to chronic blood loss. If patients have chronic blood loss, they may have iron loss and have what we call a microcytic hypochromic anemia, and these patients may need iron supplementation as well. Aplastic anemia is a dysfunction of the bone marrow. 
It can occur due to radiation or chemotherapy or other drugs or toxins, or due to autoimmune diseases like lupus. Megaloblastic anemia creates large, fragile, and odd-shaped red blood cells, often due to vitamin B12 or folic acid deficiency. It can also occur in pernicious anemia or patients who've had a total gastrectomy, since the cells in the stomach are responsible for um, management of vitamin B12. Hemolytic anemia is due to destruction of red blood cells, and this often can occur in hereditary diseases like sickle cell anemia or spherocytosis. Also, certain implanted devices may destroy red blood cells. Now that we've talked about red blood cells, we're going to shift gears and talk about infection and inflammation with the understanding that the body is constantly, constantly exposed to all sorts of pathogens, bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites throughout the entire body. We have normal flora that live healthily in our systems, as well as dangerous pathogens that need to be kept from harming the body. So now we're going to talk about white blood cells or leukocytes. Normal concentration of these cells in the blood is three to 10,000 per microliter of blood. These are basically mobile units that go to sites of infection in a seek and destroy mission. Many of them use a process called chemotaxis where chemical substances cause the white blood cells to move toward the source of the chemical. There are many different kinds of leukocytes. There are myelocytic cells. They're derived from myeloblasts in the bone marrow. Uh, so you may see polymorphonuclear cells, which are all called, also called polys or granulocytes. These are cells that ingest and destroy pathogenic organisms. There are neutrophils, which respond to tissue in injury and bacterial infection. There are eosinophils, which respond to parasitic infections and allergic reactions. There are basophils, which release heparin and histamine in response to allergic reactions. And just as an aside, we talked about basophils. There are also mast cells, which are like basophils, but instead of in the circulation, we find them in perivascular tissue spaces. Besides the polymorphonuclear cells, we also have monocytes, which grow into macrophages, and they are cells that can ingest very large particles um, as needed. All of those are the myelocytic cells. We also have lymphocytic cells, which are derived from lymphoblasts, and they form in your lymph glands, your spleen, your thymus, tonsils, and primarily we're talking about lymphocytes. So if you ever look at a CBC, a complete blood count, with a differential, a CBC with a diff, it will show you all of these different cells. And we have the percentages here for what we normally see. About two-thirds neutrophils, about a third lymphocytes, um, and just a tiny few percentage of monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. When the body gets injured, the substances released by the injured cells create a cascade of different effects in the body. They cause local blood vessels to vasodilate. They cause capillaries to leak fluid out of the intravascular space into the interstitial space. Fluid starts to clot in the interstitium. Granulocytes and monocytes are also drawn towards this area of injury. And the tissue cells themselves swell. All of this process is what we refer to as inflammation. If there's any sort of vascular injury, so fibrinogen clots can wall off this area of injury in order to spread bacteria, in order to prevent spread of bacteria or toxins throughout the body. A lot of neutrophils will come into that area and the body will start to produce more neutrophils. Commonly we call this a white count, where instead of the three to 10 per, three to 10,000 per microliter, you can see commonly 15 to 25,000 white blood cells per microliter. And these are mostly due to neutrophils in the case of um, an injury or bacterial infection. Pus, which we see at sites of infection, is usually cre caused by a mixture of necrotic dead tissue, dead neutrophils and macrophages, and um, other dead pieces of tissue. That's it for this recording. Please let me know if you have any questions.